Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Molino bailey I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute. And as always, my co-host, CEO, and owner of Cognitive Behavior Institute, Dr. Kevin Caridad. On this week's episode, we are joined by Juliet B. Martinez, who is a freelance writer in the parenting space, whose work revolves around child development and the mental and physical health of families. She lives in Pittsburgh with her husband and two kids. So Julia, thank you so much for being with us. We certainly appreciate you taking the time. It was really nice of you to invite me. Wonderful. We're we're very glad you're here. And we're really looking forward to talking to you today about children's mental health. And can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in writing on these issues? I think part of it, it's just my personality. I'm very interested in process. I'm always looking at things and looking at people and thinking, what was the thought process there? <laughs> um, you know, there's a, so a lot of times, um, <clears throat> yeah, like who, who was, who, who was in the room? Why did that happen? What went into that? And so psychology of course affects a lot of why we do things, a lot of those thought processes. Right. Um, and it just is something that's I'm interested in. Uh, but I also grew up with a significantly mentally ill parent. Uh, my mom was struggled with mental illness for my whole childhood and still, although she's doing all right, she's doing, she's pretty stable now, thank goodness. Um, but, uh, you know, it just really gave me a sensitivity and connection to mental health, mental illness, the importance of destigmatizing it, talking about it, educating people and, the desire to educate myself too. Absolutely. Those are all very important topics that you just mentioned, especially when it comes to destigmatizing uh, mental health. So you had recently published an article on helping children cope with eviction trauma, mm-hmm. and that was in Britannica for parents. Can you talk to us a little bit about the potential harm of eviction on a child's mental health? You know, uh, any type of forced displacement is very traumatic for a child. Um, and, you know, really, in fairness, it's traumatic for the whole family. It's not just children, but um, for children who are in that, what researchers call like that critical window of time where they're I- intensively involved in their development, they need a lot of stability and safety. And to lose that is very damaging. And there has been some research on this um, showing that even for a family to be behind on their rent, is uh, can have effects on the child's development and can cause developmental delays um, that can, you know, the impact of that can last even into adulthood. So it's a, it's a really important topic. And I wanna say, I think, you know, just do, re, working on this, I realized what a patent evil eviction really is because it's very harmful for the parents Mothers are much more likely to be evicted than fathers, unfortunately. Um, it is a, it's a, an example of structural inequality where in the black community, uh, people are much more highly at risk of being evicted than white people. Um, there are just so many, there's so many damages and families who are evicted tend to have to relocate into neighborhoods with more crime and lower income neighborhoods they may have to move into substandard housing. So that may cause them other health problems, physical health problems as a result. So there are like, it's almost a cascade of harms. No, you know, from a mental health side, the sense of particularly with anxiety, uncertainty uh, on top of the stressors of already what's going on and that uncertainty I'm sure is economic in nature. Uh, it's obviously housing, which on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the very basic one. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine also then making decisions about health and medicine uh, can also kind of really get in the way. Uh, I wonder, is there any personal stories uh, that you can speak to uh, about that really illustrate the the impact uh, on the individual and how, the, I, I know we talked very high level, how it impacts them to adulthood. But yeah. It'd be nice, I think, for, for our listeners to kind of make that a little bit more concrete. 
Well, one parent that I spoke to for this story told me that her firstborn, well, actually, no, he's her stepson, and but he's the oldest child in, in her home. Um, so she has uh, the, her stepson and then three uh, bio daughters uh, that live with her and her husband. And um, her stepson, after they had to move, because he had lived in the house, he had lived in that house his whole life, the house that they were evicted from. And they moved in with uh, the mom's mother. So the grandmother for the bio daughters, this was a pretty, I mean, I think in many ways it was a pretty low income, I mean, sorry, low impact um, eviction in some ways. They didn't become homeless. You know, there were, in, it wasn't, their, their stuff wasn't thrown out onto the street. But this little boy who was five at the time developed very severe um, separation anxiety from his dad. And that caused a bunch of different problems for him uh, to where he and his dad started going and doing some pretty intensive um, parent coaching therapy um, that was helping, but it was a very, very hard experience for this little boy. And of course, what I thought was interesting, I mean, I think it's always interesting how things affect people differently. Uh, one of the uh, daughters, one of his sisters was like, cool, we're going to live with grandma. She was <laughs> completely great. And like, it didn't affect her at all. Another child in the family uh, has low vision and is autistic. So when she, you know, when you think about the need for things to be very stable, both from a, a standpoint of someone who has low vision and needs to be able to get around and know where things are, and a child with uh, maybe low tolerance for frustration, low tolerance for change, um, that was very hard for her, you know? So it really does affect different people and different kids differently. But um, and I can also share for myself, I was 13 when my family's home was uh, foreclosed on. My parents shielded me from this knowledge. They were, they just made it like we were moving. Um, we actually, because my parents are, I mean, partly I think uh, my people, people in my hometown of Grand Junction, Colorado, have always said that my parents were free spirits and uh, that's definitely does describe them. So we moved from Grand Junction to Guatemala. We moved to Central America at that time. My parents were like, you know what, let's go. Let's, it'll be an adventure. It was difficult. Um, and I knew in my heart that there was more happening than I knew about. You know, I didn't real I didn't get that information until later that we had our house had actually been foreclosed on. But even just that, like when I started reporting this story, I realized how like it weighed on me so much. It was a very emotionally for me, there was still those vestiges of that experience, even though again. My parents had made it a pretty, pretty low key displacement, you know, in terms of making us feel like it was planned and that we had control over it and stuff like that. So it really does have lasting effects. And you, as an adult, you may not know that that's going to pop up, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it can be something that affects one's sense of mental wellness far into the future. It's an interesting how you say that because I hadn't really given it thought till our conversation today. Uh, even growing up in my household, you know, my father was single family, uh, single single uh, earner household, and I remember my mother telling stories later on as a teenager, but as a kid, how they couldn't pay the mortgage at times. I had to make a decision on getting my brother a surgery for his eye or what have you. Wow. And I come to think now how I look at finances and I wonder how connected that is and how it is long lasting. So it's interesting that, mm -hmm. that you say that. I can imagine it could be very scary and unsettling as a kid, uh, you know, seeing your parents worry when they're kind of the this uh, this beacon of safety and strength and then to see that vulnerability. I could see that could be uh, yeah. very impactful on many uh, as they yeah. develop. It definitely affected my relationship with money. I mean, I knew that because I knew that there were there were debts that my parents couldn't pay. And so as I went into young adulthood and became independent, I was very, very scared of being in debt. And even like uh, I had an irrational fear of being in debt. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't just like smart with my money. I was very scared of it. So, um, uh, yeah, it you know. Fortunately, I married somebody who was able to kind of 
temper that with saying, you know, it's, it's okay. Like it's not the end of the world and kind of help me rethink and restructure some of that for myself. But um, yeah, it really does affect us. It really does affect us. And as you say, you have a spouse there to kind of help you as an adult or as a kid, you know, when you're being shielded, you're hearing things, parents don't realize what you're being, what you're hearing and can really just kind of stew around there for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the things that we pick up on, especially kids can be so sensitive to emotional currents and then they have no, the, a lot of times they may not have any uh, explicit information with which to explain that to themselves. Sure. And I think that that's one of the ways that, that, you know, things, those kind of like unhealthy thought patterns can come in you know, kids tend to blame themselves or feel shame for things. And then if it's not, um, if it's not explained at the same time, I would not, I would not urge parents, you know, based on my experience, the people I talk to and my research. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the business of giving like uh, professional advice. <laughs> That's not my uh, bailiwick, but um, I wouldn't, I still, I wouldn't say that parents should be super frank with their kids about being evicted, you know, or losing their housing. Those are situations that are just very difficult. They're very complicated and delicate. And honestly, I'm not sure there's a really good way. You just do your best. <laughs> you just try your best. You there's know? no manual on that. Right, that's, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's why coming back to, I think that is why we have to start looking at these things from a broader lens too that eviction and housing insecurity are patent evils. I mean, I think they should be looked at as human rights violations. It Nobody should be going through this. It is so damaging. You bring up an excellent point, especially with what's happening today in America and related to the pandemic. Um, we've seen a lot of these eviction moratoriums that are, you know, teetering back and forth between it's going to be extended and then no, it's not. And then it's going to be extended and then no, it's not. So I'm sure, you know, just adding gasoline on the fire as far as living in a state of uncertainty and when it comes to, you know, jobs that are impacted due to the pandemic and shutdowns, I'm sure this is all, all something that you're, you know, seeing and hearing about how it's affecting people in their everyday lives even more. Yeah, well, you know, before the um, before the pandemic even started, there was a huge housing housing crisis in this country. And I mean, when you talk about now, you know, there's a great study by the Aspen Institute talking about how 40 million people in the United States are at risk of losing their housing. But even before the pandemic, um, a almost half of renter households were already spending more than a third of their income on housing and a quarter of renter households were spending more than half their income on housing. So this is very unstable. This is a very unstable condition to live in. Uh, and for those below the poverty line, most renters are spending at least half. This is ridiculous. It's completely unsustainable. And that was before the pandemic. And then when you think about how low income communities have a lot of service workers, many of whom have been affected by COVID. There've been deaths in their communities that they've been having to deal with and trying to continue while stores and restaurants and bars shut down. And I'm not arguing with that. I think that stores and restaurants and bars should be, you know, there should be limitations. We have to get through this and that's one way to do it. But when you introduce that additional income insecurity, um, it has just really, really destabilized a lot of families. What do you think the current politics uh, or the, the system in which the economic system we're in mm -hmm. uh, is influencing kind of the situation where we are today with this insecurity of housing and uh, now economics on top of that and potentially food insecurity as we hear uh, both the Secretary of Treasury as well as the head of uh, the Federal Reserve uh, suggesting that we're about to have a spike in inflation due to many different reasons. You know, you know when I hear you say there's, the, I could see this visual in my head of these lines of just coming closer together about what's uh, ex expendable income one has with housing, and then you have food costs go up. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, what we're entering into uh, right now, and kind of we've been moving into for a number of years, is a situation similar to what the United States was uh, was in in the uh, 1920s, which was a greater and greater and greater separation between rich and poor. 
Okay, so the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer in this polarization of uh, wealth between wealth and poverty was very destabling and it led, it was destabilizing and it led to the Great Depression. It was one of the major factors that led to the Great Depression. Of course, during the Great Depression, wealthy people didn't really suffer. I mean, yes, there were some people who lost everything, but those who were, you know, very wealthy didn't suffer. They were fine. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that here we are a hundred years later, and we're in a very similar situation. You know, I think you have to look at this from the standpoint of, I think, you know, one element of this is structural racism. A lot of the economic reforms that have, that where people have tried to reduce the extremes of wealth and poverty in this country have, um, the people who have opposed them have opposed them because they didn't want to help black people. I mean, that's, I mean, that's real. That has happened in this country. And that's still a very powerful motivator for a lot of people who oppose economic reforms that help poor people. Um, just, I mean, it's, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. It's a completely, it, 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 it represents a complete lack of compassion and complete lack of fellow feeling in this country. And I'm not saying that everybody has that, but there is, a, there are very large parts of this, you know, of our, our country that do feel that way, that don't want to help people who don't look like them. And that's a real shame. I think if we could address that, I think it would make things a lot better for everybody. No, because I, it would introduce that will to change and help everybody. You know, as my master's in clinical social work, we look at those vulnerable populations, as you describe, and, and all the things that have led up policies and otherwise, you know, and sometimes still people doubt uh, that that's happening, even though when you have all the evidence there. And so I wonder, based upon your research and your focus on this, have you seen policies uh, in other countries that are maybe uh, less diverse? So they're kind of very yeah. similar. And so where you can see those disparities are different so that we can challenge those here that think they don't have an impact. You know, is there any data that you've gone to or, or countries that you can see where that it's different? You know, my research has mainly focused in the United States. Um, and I, so I, I, I'm not an expert there, but I can speak to that issue of doubt. And I will tell you a personal story that does not reflect yeah. well on me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, my husband is Mexican American. He grew up in Chicago. He grew up in Mexican neighborhoods in Chicago. He experienced racial, uh, racial profiling, uh, intensive policing. He was, um, he experienced a lot of, uh, aggression from white neighbors. He has been through things. Um, and I remember there was this time when uh, we were still both in college. We kind of left and went back to college. We were late bloomers um, when we got married. And I remember this time that he came home and he was really angry. And he said uh, that they lost my paperwork in the financial aid office. They're trying to stick it to me. They don't want me to be here. And it was, he went to a small music college. He's a musician. He went to a small college and it was mostly white. And I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. They didn't want, they're not trying to stick it to you. It was an accident, right? That's that element of doubt. Okay. So that's me doubting that what he sensed or perceived was right. As though I know better than he does. The fact is that I don't know better because I have not experienced racism. I don't know better. And as you know, part of the, I mean, just like woven into the stuff of whiteness is this idea that we know better and we don't. We have to trust that people who have experienced racism know what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like. And if it looks like racism and it feels like racism and it smells like racism, it is racism. So, you know, I'm glad to say that was early in our marriage and I, uh, you know, I, I learned to trust him when he said, this is racism. Um, I'm sad that I had to learn that as an adult. I wish I had been able to grow up knowing that. Um, and I'm, and you know, it's not to say that that was the last time that I ever did something unconsciously racist in my marriage or with anybody else, because it wasn't, but um, it was a learning experience. And I think that that's, 
you know, that's an important thing to look at, not, well, what are the numbers? How can this be proven to me? Prove to me that there's structural racism. No, it, we have to listen. White people have to listen. We have to be willing to trust that we're not experts on racism. We're just not. Um, a friend of mine said something I thought was very perceptive, which is that privilege is like having a bright light shown in your face. Your eyes are open, but you can't see. So we have to learn to trust and listen to people of color who are telling us and have been saying it for decades. For that's, centuries. A, that's a good point. I think one last question I'd like to get uh, some feedback on. I know there's many policies trying to address this and something that's come back into the forefront is basic uh, minimum income. And one, are you familiar with it? Two, what are your yeah. thoughts? And the last one is this argument of giving basic income to individuals and how that impacts motivation. What are your thoughts on that? Um, that's a great question. I am familiar with basic universal basic income. Um, I support it. I, from a couple of different perspectives. One, I think it's just practical. Um, when, I mean, there's like, this is something that my husband likes to say, when you give poor people money, they go out and spend it because they need, they have a lot of things they need and they, um, you know, and so it, they don't hold on to it. They don't put it in savings. Generally speaking, they, it's at the grocery store, it's at the clothing store, they're spending it. So that's good for the economy. That's one very practical level. Um, another level that for me is very close to my heart is that it, it allows people to have dignity. Um, you know, my religious background is Baha'i and the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty is like a very important <laughs> teaching for in my faith that I've grown up with. So the idea that people deserve to have a dignified life, even if they aren't, you know, even if they're not wealthy, even if they can't work, I mean, everybody deserves to have basic human dignity. Does it affect motivation? I don't think so. I think it might for some people. I mean, I don't think there's a universal yes or no to that. Um, but again, and speaking as someone who I have a chronic illness, so I don't do well with like, you know, a lot of different kinds of full-time work and stuff. That's why I'm a freelancer. Um, I think it's okay. I don't know. I just think it's okay. Like, I don't think anybody has to earn the right to eat or to have a place to live or just to have like, you know, basic dignity. I don't think anybody has to earn that. I think that should be a given and that there will always be people who are interested and energetic and that want to try things. I mean, that always that have ideas and want to work on them and those people can and should have more money. That's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But that I don't think anybody should have to earn the right to have basic human dignity. And that's what you have when you have a place to live. And you can feed your kids and you can get them medical care and you can get yourself medical care or mental health care as needed. Thank you for that. Yes. Thanks, Thank you so much for, for your perspective. And uh, we really enjoyed your thoughts today. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It was really nice of you to ask me. Thank you. And thank you so much to the listeners for this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We hope you all stay safe and healthy and we will see you next time. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute, and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.